system of business, as the key members are all here and ready. And that is a debate on motion 2271 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on employment support. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Jamie Hepburn to speak and move the motion. Minister, please. Thank you, President Officer. And lest I forget, let me move the motion in my name uh, at the outset. Back in April, on its introduction, uh, this government welcomed uh, the UK Job Retention Scheme. Uh, the furlough scheme has maintained the viability of businesses and protected jobs in what has been a period unlike anything we have experienced in our lifetime. As the economy opens gradually and safely, some have been able to return to their jobs, but the Job Retention Scheme continues to support many today. So, while we welcome measures taken by the UK Government, UK Ministers should follow the lead of other European countries by extending the Job Retention Scheme. Ending the furlough scheme prematurely runs the risk of pushing many businesses and employees into crisis. And if Murdo Fraser can explain why that's a sensible thing to do, I'll happily give way. Murdo Fraser. I'm, I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way so early in the speech. I just wanted them at this very early stage this is to set out on the record, if you would, that the UK furlough scheme has been amongst the most generous in the world. Minister. I I'm quite happy to concede that the UK furlough scheme has been an excellent initiative. And that might be why I am here today, Mr Fraser, urging the UK Government to extend such a sensible scheme. And I look forward to you supporting that at decision time this evening. If I think, officer, the Scottish Government has just yesterday published new analysis on Scottish firms' use of the furlough scheme. It shows that uh, over the piece, nearly 800,000 people in Scotland have been supported by that scheme. And an estimated 15% of Scotland's workforce are still in furlough. And that of all the firms surveyed, two-thirds were still furloughing their employees to some extent. And as highlighted by the Scottish Government's Chief Economic Advisor in his report yesterday, extending the job retention scheme for even just eight months could reduce unemployment in Scotland by 61,000 through the first half of next year. Although only a temporary measure, it would have a positive impact on the labour market, preventing un unnecessarily higher levels of unemployment over the next few years. Many businesses have a viable long-term future, but only if they continue to be supported. Keeping people in jobs rather than transferring the cost to the state through the social security system makes sense. Sustaining businesses to reduce economic decline, which jeopardises other businesses and jobs, makes sense. Without longer term support, there is a very real risk that firms will fall off the cliff edge. Without longer term support, there is a very real risk that many people who otherwise might not may fall out of the labour market. Presiding officer, that does not make sense. And I give way to Willie Rennie to hear some Willie comments. Rennie, please. Um, I, I actually support the motion today and the Minister's contribution so far. Back in June, um, this Parliament agreed to set out in financial terms what the actual total sum, the benefit would be or has been to Scotland from the furlough scheme. Has the Minister been able to calculate that and can he tell us what that figure is? What's the benefit to Scotland financially? Minister. It, well, it, just yesterday, it, the uh, Chief Economic Advisor, I've just alluded to, the Chief Economic Advisor published a full assessment of the benefits of that, uh, of the introduction of the furlough scheme. And I would refer uh, Mr Rennie uh, to uh, uh, look uh, at that and see it in more uh, detail. Uh, I'm afraid not, Mr Rennie. I, I, happy to give way, perhaps, in uh, closing. Uh, President Officer, in calling for the, the UK Government to extend the furlough scheme, uh, I recognise the role that this Government must play in supporting businesses and workers in Scotland. That is a role we have taken seriously and one we continue to take seriously. It is why we move quickly at the outset of this crisis to put in place a package of support worth more than £2.3 billion for Scotland's businesses. Support has been essential for Scotland's business community and so too have we looked to bridge gaps and support wherever we can. That support has included £34 million for the newly self-employed hardship fund to provide help for those who entered self-employment after April 2019 who were not covered by UK government support. Our support has included £30 million for the Creative Tourism and Hospitality Enterprises Hardship Fund. In August, the First Minister announced £59 million support for an important creative industries sector. And we were supporting our recovery with a £100 million Green Jobs Fund, our £60 million Youth Guarantee, our £25 million Transition Training Fund and other interventions as we move forward. President, I going to check how long I have. I will give way then to Ms Bailey very briefly. 
Thank you Jackie very Bailey. much. The, the Minister is indeed kind to do so. I wonder whether he could tell us, in terms of the £60 million Youth Guarantee Fund, how many young people will actually be provided for, for, for that money? Minister. It, well, the fundamental principle of the scheme, Ms Bailey, is to guarantee every young person in Scotland the chance to get employment, education and training. Yeah. Now, I'm not suggesting that that fund in itself will cover all of that, but clearly that is the role it will uh, play. That's the nature of a guarantee, uh, Ms uh, Bailey. Uh, President, President Officer, we uh, need the UK Government though, to continue its support too. Uh, we've seen a number of other countries uh, realise that support through equivalent schemes will need to continue in the medium to longer term. France and Germany are both extending their equivalent to the furlough scheme. Ireland and Denmark, similarly sized countries to Scotland, have both extended their support schemes too. The governments of these countries have realised that assisting their economies, protecting jobs and promoting business survival uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, only able to be done through ongoing help and support. Presiding officer, why can't the Chancellor do the same? And let me be clear, we're Scotland, a similarly sized country to Ireland, Denmark, an independent country, that's what we would be doing right now. Yet, according to the UK Chancellor, this is not the right approach for workers and employers here. In a recent letter to the Economy Secretary, he stated that leaving the furlough scheme open forever gives people false hope that it will always be possible to return to the jobs they had before. But we are not asking for the furlough scheme to be continued forever. It was introduced in the first place, though, because restrictions on normal economic activity it had to be put in place to save lives. The progress we have made in tackling COVID-19, as fragile as that may be, has already meant that businesses in many sectors that face restrictions at the start of the crisis are now able to open safely. But some restrictions remain, and they are essential if we are to contain the spread of the virus. Ending the, the furlough scheme prematurely before we're able to lift those restrictions will cause unnecessary and widespread disruption. That people who are doing the right thing just now by staying home, by keeping their business closed, should not be abandoned while they still need support. And even though in some sectors a significant number of people have already gone back to work, we should recognise the research we published yesterday indicates there may still be around two thirds of businesses overall who have at least one person on furlough. President Officer, in the Chancellor's summer economic update, he announced the job retention bonus scheme. Uh, that's a, a one-off payment scheme to employers of £1,000 for every employee previously claimed for under furlough who remain in continuous employment through to the 31st of January 20, 2021. But we're concerned that it does not target support at the employers and workers who are most likely to need it. Introducing the bonus scheme, it will cost uh, around £9.4 billion if all employers take up that scheme UK-wide. However, the estimated cost of a temporary extension of the furlough scheme is estimated to be around £10 billion. The bonus scheme is untargeted, meaning some firms could be paid for retaining jobs which were never actually at risk. Extending the furlough scheme could therefore be more effective at saving jobs actually, actually at risk in the short term and a better utilisation of public funds. And, President Officer, it isn't just the view of the Scottish Government that the job retention scheme be extended. Many others have made similar calls for the UK Government to change its approach. The General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Union Congress has said the UK Government must ensure that the scheme continues past October. The General Secretary of Unite has recently just called for the same. And our business organisations who I speak with and engage with regularly are expressing their concern about a premature end to the furlough scheme. President Officer, we will take all possible action to support the economy. As outlined in our programme for government, this includes a, a range of measures to protect key sectors badly affected by the pandemic. But employers and workers in Scotland continue to need 
wider support. Support that currently can only be offered by the UK government. They have done this correctly through using borrowing powers, powers that the Scottish Government doesn't have. They have delivered their schemes, again correctly, through HMRC, an agency that the Scottish Government has no responsibility for. We need to be able to respond to the continuing public health challenge of COVID-19. As we've seen in Scotland and other parts of the UK, and indeed globally, that will sometimes mean reintroducing restrictions to help contain the virus to save lives. The furlough scheme has been the foundation of the support available to businesses and workers to help them comply with public health requirements. It's been a welcome contribution in responding to COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic is not, presiding officer, going to disappear at the end of next month, and neither is the economic impact. So ending the furlough scheme prematurely would not be a welcome contribution to responding to COVID-19. The UK government's insistence that the scheme should end on the 31st of October with no indication of a replacement is out of step with the decisions many other countries are taking. It's out of step with the views of so many here in Scotland and across the UK and out of step with the needs of employers and workers the length and breadth of the country. Presiding officer, the UK government must extend the furlough scheme and this evening at decision time this parliament must make its voice heard in calling for just that. Thank you very much, Minister. I now call on Maurice Golden to speak to move Amendment 2271.2. Mr Golden, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. No one should be under any illusion that we, we face anything less than a full-blown jobs crisis. The latest figures show Scotland now is the highest unemployment rate of anywhere in the UK. The rate here is 4.6%. In England, it's 4.1%, Wales, 3.1%, and Northern Ireland, 2.9%. These are not just numbers, but real people facing redundancy across Scotland. At Rolls-Royce, in the oil and gas sector, at our major city airports, and in high streets up and down the country. Every effort must be made to save jobs and get people back to work. I welcome Labour's amendment, which is a positive addition to the debate, and I look forward to hearing more from them as well as any other contributors. The Scottish Government have brought forward some welcome proposals to aid our economic recovery. For example, the Logan Report on Digital Skills and Infrastructure, which contains recommendations for both immediate action and long-term strategic change that long-term change will, need to, will be needed to build res resilience and opportunity in the employment market in order to mitigate a future crisis. The same can be said of Benny Higgins' report, which is focused on jobs and reducing inequality. The former is obviously an immediate concern, but tackling inequality is especially important over the long term. It will be crucial for building that resilience I spoke of and also to ensure equal opportunity of employment for all. The Higgins report was also right to highlight the need to focus on the opportunities available to young people because it is young people bearing the brunt of job losses, not least because many work in hard hit sectors such as hospitality, where the pub trade alone could see as many as 12,500 jobs go. As such, I welcome the youth guarantee outlined in Sagde Begbie's initial report to help ensure young people are given targeted support. That sh support should, should be particularly tailored to smaller firms, given they, as the FSB advise, account for 99.3% of all private sector businesses. It would also be helpful if the various employment support schemes were better coordinated to further aid the youth guarantee in order to help as many young people as possible. It is vital it complements the Chancellor's new £2 billion kickstart kick scheme for 16 to 24-year-olds who are most at risk of long-term unemployment. And I was pleased to see Sandy Begbie recommend that approach. 
I urge ministers to get behind to kickstart, just as they did the Chancellor's furlough scheme, which the SNP have admitted is one of the best in the world. The Economic uh, Cabinet Secretary went as far to say as it was a lifeline. Happy to give way. George Adam. I thank the member for taking the intervention, but I've just got one point. Last week in a debate in the House of Commons, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Barclay, said it is no one's interest for the scheme to continue, the least of all those trapped in a job that only exists because of the furlough scheme. Does the member agree with this? And if so, does the member actually have anything to say to those that are trapped in these sectors that are yet to reopen? Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank the member for that intervention. I mean, if we listen to the SNP and the Scottish Government paper, COVID-19 analysis of extending the coronavirus job retention scheme, they said the furlough scheme cannot continue indefinitely. They've also admitted, I've mentioned, that this, is, this scheme is among the best in the world, but there's a balance to be struck. I'm just developing this. Uh, spending more increases debt, De can decrease the potential credit rating for the UK, increase the cost of borrowing and risk stagflation. However, we do need to stop long-term scarring. And that's why I've consistently argued for sector-specific packages, as the member mentioned in his uh, intervention. Now, uh, perhaps that's... Uh, I'll, I'll happy to go. Minister? I mean, he will recognise, of course, that we are not calling for the scheme to be extended for time immemorial. We are talking for a sensible extension to support people through a very difficult time. And would he recognise that a short eight-month extension, just an eight-month extension, has the potential to save 61,000 jobs in Scotland over the first half of next year? Surely that's something we should be getting behind. Maurice Golden. Thank you, uh, Deputy President Officer. I think the member uh, should understand the wider economic impact and indeed, as I have mentioned, in terms of uh, increasing uh, borrowing, the risk to the overall deficit. And these are the issues that the Chancellor will be considering. I'm going to make progress now, thank you. Um, but I, I also respect the Minister, indeed the Cabinet Secretary's views on the, the furlough scheme, but perhaps uh, some of the issues around the furlough, if they'd listened to the SNP backbenchers the last time I mentioned it, who booed the scheme here in this chamber, unfortunately putting party politics ahead of welcoming almost a million Scottish jobs being saved. But the furlough scheme must end uh, at some point, uh, as the SNP have admitted. Even once it draws to a close, though, it is not the end of the story, because the job retention bonus will, will pay for around about £1,000 for every furlough employee who is kept on. The furlough scheme is just one part of the massive £16 billion support the UK government has deployed in Scotland. I take it I don't have extra time, Deputy President Officer. Give me extra time for interventions just now, yes, so Keith, Keith Brown. Brown. Can I thank the member for giving way and ask whether he agrees with the Resolution Foundation who have said that the job retention bonus will not make a major difference to employment levels and cites the significant deadweight that the Minister referred to. And if he doesn't agree with the Resolution Foundation at that point, can he explain why? Boris uh, uh, I think Keith Brown, who presided on uh, a disastrous economic uh, uh, strategy for Scotland during his tenure, has got quite a hard neck coming and trying to lecture me on economics. Uh, and I will uh, I'll, I'll outline other measures which are complementary to the job retention bonus. For example, 63,000 Scottish businesses have benefited from a bounce-back loan from the UK government worth £1.8 billion. I'm going to make progress, Deputy President Officer. More than 2,600 firms have received support from the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme worth almost £600 million. VAT has been slashed to just 5% to help our hospitality industry and hospitality businesses got another boost, as did families, with the Eat Out to Help Out scheme serving up more than 8,500 half-price meals in Scotland. That is all direct help from the UK government to protect businesses and save jobs. Of course, the story doesn't end there, and the UK government must look at further measures to support specific sectors. 
but we must also address deep-seated problems in the Scottish economy that existed before COVID. In August, the number of people starting new jobs dropped to its lowest rate since February, but even before the crisis, Scotland's jobs rate was the worst across the UK. Since the SNP took power, the number of Scots in work has only increased by 4.6% compared with 10.2% for the UK in the whole. In effect, SNP policies have cost Scotland more than 250,000 jobs. In contrast, the Scottish Conservatives have set out a range of practical measures to save jobs, get the economy moving and build resilience against future shock shocks. For example, job security councils to match skills with vacancies to mitigate further unemployment, a hardship fund for businesses forced to reclose because of local lockdowns, a town centre adaptation fund to improve active travel and make other health and safety changes, a Scotland first procurement plan that would favour local suppliers, creating a joint UK and Scottish infrastructure investment vehicle to allow joint funding of national level projects and using the city deals model to help our smaller towns and rural areas and much more besides Deputy President Officer. These policies are ready to help people now and if the Scottish Government is willing to listen, put protecting jobs and saving the economy ahead of constitutional arguments, if they can rise to that, the Scottish Conservatives stand ready to help. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I now call Jackie Bailey to speak to and move Amendment 2271.1. Ms Bailey, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to discuss the support that is needed to help employers retain jobs across the UK and where that is not possible, to help people who find themselves unemployed to get a job. But the figures are stark, on a scale hitherto unseen, and it will worsen substantially when the job retention scheme comes to an end in October. Without the option of furlough, literally millions of workers across the UK would have found themselves immediately unemployed with no income and no idea of when or if they would be able to find work again. That includes over 800,000 workers in Scotland who are on the furlough scheme. Estimates suggest, though, that when furlough unwinds, as many as 350,000 people in Scotland could find themselves out of work. And according to the IPPR, 34% of young people will lose their jobs when furlough ends. That's 100,000 young people, the highest ever level of youth unemployment seen in this country. That is truly catastrophic. And we need radical action if we're not to condemn a generation of young people to the dole queue. So anything we do must be about providing real hope and opportunity and doing it quickly. We cannot afford to wait. The last few weeks have shown that this virus is far from over, which in turn means that the problems that COVID-19 has created for business and industry aren't over either. It therefore makes almost no sense to end the job retention scheme next month. Employers do need continuing support. So we need the job retention scheme to continue in some form. And I have argued before for sector-specific deals, support for those industries that have been worst hit by, hit by the pandemic, where there is no certainty for their employees. That support must be tailored to the needs, strengths and weaknesses of the Scottish economy. Our economy has a greater reliance on sectors like tourism and hospitality, aviation, as we debated yesterday, oil and gas. We have greater reliance on them than economies elsewhere in the UK. So that would be a sensible approach to take. But equally, I want to see both governments invest in growing particular sectors like financial services and IT to drive forward increased employment opportunities. Do you know, waiting until businesses fail is not an option. And we should be working with CBI Scotland, the Chambers of Commerce, FSB and others to identify those areas at risk and invest. So let's have interventions that address the issues faced by those in work who might be made redundant to prevent job loss. But we need to focus quickly on implementing the Scottish Government's proposals to tackle the widespread unemployment that we are experiencing already. This is without doubt the biggest economic issue of our times. We cannot afford to sit around and wait for the UK Government to act. This requires both the Scottish Government and UK governments to work together. And, Presiding Officer, I support fully the Alliance for Full Employment initiated 
by Gordon Brown with the Welsh Government, Metro Mayors of City and regions across England. Coming together to act together on this employment crisis is hugely important. Mobilising all of the resources across the UK to end the recession and create good quality jobs. It's a great initiative. It's exactly what is needed. Will the Scottish Government join in? Will they cooperate with others across the UK to focus on jobs? And I'm happy to take an intervention from the Minister. Yes or no? Uh, uh, Minister. If people uh, approach us and let us know about things, then we might consider con uh, cooperating with them. <laughs> I look forward to the Minister positively Jamie, let me call you signing back up. In, but oh, there you are. Off you thank go. you, Presiding Officer. I was saying I look forward to the Minister positively signing up then. Because we do need to work together. Our young people need us to work together, including those facing unemployment. They need us to work together too. So the UK government's attempt to tackle youth unemployment is the kickstart scheme for 16 to 24 year olds. It's welcome, but to be honest, it's simply not enough. The scheme will only assess 250,000 of the 3.5 million under 25s not in full-time education and then only for six months. But I am interested to know what the Scottish Government's jobs guarantee delivers. Aimed at young people, the Cabinet Secretary announced 60 million for the remainder of this financial year and I understand the source of the money is from UK Barnet Consequentials. So that is welcome. The Cabinet Secretary's press release talks about providing paid employment, education and apprenticeship, training or volunteering, and I agree with all of that. But it is light on detail. So how many young people will be covered? Over what time period? Now, the Minister said this was a guarantee, but I have to say the numbers don't stack up. Given the expectation is that there will be an extra 100,000 young people out of work in Scotland as a result of the furlough scheme ending, does the Minister consider that 60 million will indeed be enough? Because it works out at £600 a head, which will not get you very far at all and is not the scale of intervention required. All the more reason to join together with the Alliance for Full Employment to maximise the funding we can put towards tackling youth unemployment is one thing making a guarantee, but we need to see it delivered and you've not provided the resources on the scale required. Happy to. Uh, Minister? I, I think this might reflect, uh, incidentally, I won't, don't want to strike a note of discord. We will be supporting your amendment. I hope we'll vote together. But I think this might reflect some of the problems within your own party, Ms Bailey. Your party leader has met Sandy Begby taking forward the job guarantee. So I would urge you, I don't know if you do it often, but speak with your party leader. I know you're the deputy leader. Have a chinwag about it and understand what the job guarantee is all about. The, Jackie the, Bailey. I, I speak to my leader all the time, but let me tell you, right, the problem is you are providing £60 million for 100,000 young people who are about to become unemployed. That is not enough. It is not the scale of the ambition that this country and our young people require. In summary, presiding officer, I want the furlough scheme extended. Of course I do. But I also want the Scottish Government to do three things. I want them to work with the Welsh Government, the regions and cities across the UK in the Alliance for Full Employment. I want the scale of their response to be sufficient to meet the scale of the challenge we face. The Scottish Government needs to set out how many young people will be helped, when and the cost of doing so. And thirdly, presiding officer, there is a huge degree of urgency. We haven't seen the detail yet. Where do the young people apply to? When will the scheme be open? Who will be delivering on the ground? Councils, um, Skills Development Scotland, private training providers, I hope them all. When will we know the detail, Cabinet Secretary? Because young people are unemployed now and there are many more to come. We are in a crisis now and it is about to get a whole lot worse. Do you know, it is politically easy to blame the UK government, harder to do something about it yourself. But if we don't act quickly and at scale, we will let down a whole generation of young people. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Ms Bailey. I now call on Alison Johnson. Ms Johnson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. From our social security system to our NHS and from social housing to social care, it is one of my core political beliefs that government should be there for people when they need help. 
The job retention scheme was established in unprecedented circumstances when over 10 million people were facing immediate and unexpected unemployment. And the UK government was absolutely right to introduce the scheme. But of course, those unprecedented circumstances are still with us. And the UK government's decision not to extend the scheme ignores the fact that so many parts of our economy are simply not back up and running. And many people in many companies in many sectors require support for a longer period. Um, I think the Conservative amendment ignores this too, and Greens will not support this. How does the Chancellor expect businesses to survive without support when they can't do business at this point because of continued restrictions? As an MSP for Lothian Region, I represent tens of thousands of people who are employed in tourism and events and other sectors which have been extremely hard hit by restrictions. Among them are the managers and employees of Carnival Chaos, an event production company in Leith. They provide sets and props for events and have done so very successfully for over 20 years. But due to restrictions, understandable restrictions on holding large events, they haven't been able to provide their services since March. And of course, the rule of six, which was introduced for the most necessary of public health reasons, means that there won't be any events for the company to support in the foreseeable future. So as they play their part in helping suppress the virus, we need to help them be able to play their part in the recovery. Carnival Chaos and hundreds of other businesses in Lothian, they're successful businesses with good track records. They can have a bright future, but they will struggle over the medium term because events entirely out with their control have disrupted their trade. So cutting a vital lifeline at a time when restrictions are being reimposed and making life even harder for them, this will con it'll condemn many viable businesses to failure and put employees out of work. But of course, this is avoidable. Now, the job retention scheme obviously comes at a cost, around £37.5 billion across the UK so far. But that pales in comparison to the £137 bailout of the irresponsible banks who caused the last economic crisis and the over £202 billion of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament estimates it would cost to renew the UK's dangerous and useless nuclear weapons programme. And the Scottish Government estimates that the cost of extending the scheme for another eight months in Scotland at around £850 million. And, you, you know, the Minister um, pointed out that that could save potentially 61,000 jobs over those months, and that's been projected by a whole number of analyses to make a significant difference to unemployment. And like many colleagues across the Chamber, I, I left school in the 1980s, a time where unemployment was consistently above £3 million. So many of us have experienced unemployment. We've experienced the suffering of friends and family who were made unemployed for reasons outside their control and struggled to find work for long periods. We cannot go back to that. The Scottish Government's analysis of the impact on unemployment of an eight-month extension of the scheme is to reduce the rate of unemployment in Scotland by two and a half percentage points in the last quarter of this year. And even as far ahead as 2023, unemployment in Scotland would be a whole 2% lower. And of course, as well as being a, a personal tragedy, long-term unemployment is, is costly, not just in terms of unemployment benefits, but in terms of health, well-being, self-confidence, self-esteem. And I think a colleague noted that the respected National Institute for Economic and Social Research similarly concludes that extending furlough beyond the end of October is a relatively inexpensive measure and by preventing a rise in long-term unemployment might have paid by for itself. Now, I'm going to um, comment, presiding officer, that if we'd had a universal basic income scheme already in place before this started, people would have had an established safety net, a safety net that might now enable them to build new livelihoods or, or take up new courses of study. I'd also like to point out that some of the most vulnerable people in our society are suffering very badly at the moment. I have constituents who who work in the communities of Tipperith, Garvold and Camp Hill. Um, you know, these organisations create invaluable work opportunities for some of our most vulnerable citizens, people with learning disabilities and other challenges. And I'm very concerned at the impact the pandemic is having on them. And I'd be grateful if the minister, in concluding, could point out what support the Scottish Government can provide to them. I think it's also important that employment support is made available to people who are obviously helping 
um, suppress can the virus I, can by... I, I, I've given you a little bit extra, but please conclude shortly. And I will, Mr Rennie, give you that extra minute back as well, because you have taken an extra minute. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, presiding officer. I will conclude just now, but I'd just like to make the point that those who are self-isolating should have access to pay, similar to sick pay, yeah. um, and also those on precarious contracts, zero-hours contracts. No, contract, you must. I'm sorry. Pattern. I really Thank am. You, you really presiding must. Officer. Thank in you. fairness, in fairness to other members who keep their time, Mr. Rennie, yes, it's all right. I'm going to give you five minutes. You're all five. right. Five, right, good, excellent. I can fill all that up. <laughs> Four or five. Um, so, from my discussions with constituents, I know that many are certainly hurting and they're worried about their future. I mean, when one in ten could be unemployed by the end of the year and that economic hit could last for three years, it's no wonder that they are concerned. And this debate is right to be focused around the furlough scheme and its extension, which is important. And we are supporting the government's motion today. We've argued for some time that the furlough scheme should be extended to ease organisations and businesses back to work when it is safe to do so. Um, consumer and business confidence has been on a roller coaster. Large tracts of the economy were shut down to suppress the virus. We had a slower easing in Scotland, which was frustrating for some businesses as the Scottish Government pursued the elimination strategy, or zero COVID, as some people call it. Now we're back to tighter restrictions in the west of Scotland and Aberdeen before that. And the rule of six, of course, is now in place, imposing restrictions on pubs and restaurants. So the economy and the economic outlook is uncertain, which I would say adds to the need to have this furlough scheme in place. And we have to remind ourselves why we had the furlough scheme in the first place. It was as much a health protection measure as it was an economic measure. It was to allow people to stay at home safely when it wasn't safe to go out and work. People couldn't necessarily afford to stay at home, and neither could businesses afford to have them at home. So the furlough scheme was there to protect people's health as as much it was to protect the economy. So it's right, I think, as we've got this uncertain period with these various degrees of lockdown and restrictions, that we should have that support mechanism continuing for as long as those restrictions in, are in place. But it's also an economic measure. The ability to keep companies viable and alive while they wait for the economic and health conditions to return, that is necessary. The company, the money that we have invested in this over the last few months could be wasted if we withdraw the support at this last minute. So therefore, we need the support to continue over a longer period of time. But this debate should really be about so much more as well, which is why I'm attracted to Jackie Bailey's amendment today. I think it sets out a wider, a broader ambition that the Scottish Government should be focusing on, as well as the inadequacies of the UK Government. Now, the Logan Review, the Higgins Report, but also the work of Sandy Begbie are a step in the right direction. And I welcome the fortnightly discussions with the Economy Secretary and her advisers, which are a, a useful thing to have. Um, but the, we must think much bigger. Um, the, the country that we created after the Second World War was much bigger, bolder and better. And I think we should be having the same kind of ambition as we recover from this economic catastrophe. So the Chancellor's announcement later on this month will be the start of that process. The recovery plan that he hopefully will set out will not just be about the economic measures and the interventions that we should be making, but also the size of the state. And any idea that we should be trying to recover this investment over the last uh, few months in a short period of time and inflicting potential economic pain um, should not be the thing that we should pursue. Um, there is significant tolerance in the international markets to borrow more because the United Kingdom um, is seen as a good place uh, to invest. So therefore we should use that opportunity to build a new and better and greener economy, investing in renewable technologies, but also making sure it's a fairer society as well and investing in our universities, our excellent uh, universities. But we need to go beyond the furlough scheme as well. Today, we've not talked about the self-employed, but they need support as well. And that's not mentioned in the motion, and it should be. We've not talked about the gaps in the financial support that are still there, and people are suffering far too much, way beyond 
what was necessary. And Jamie Stonehour, the former member of this parliament, has been doing a sterling job in making sure that people and the government actually addresses the support that's necessary uh, for those people. But Alison Johnson was right. There was an opportunity to do a universal basic income, and I was disappointed that the minister didn't even refer to it in his contribution uh, this afternoon. Well, the give way. Um, I'm actually about to... Sorry, Mr Doris, I'm about to uh, conclude. I know he's desperate to get in today. Um, but the, the, final, the final thing I want the government to pursue is the, the bringing forward of the rollout of the childcare um, proposition, because we cannot afford to wait for up to a year for that to happen, because there is no strong economic recovery without a robust childcare offer. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to the open debate, and I call Keith Brown to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. The COVID-19 pandemic has, without a doubt, had an extremely serious impact on the economy right across the world, uh, the UK, and of course, Scotland's no exception. Where figures published yesterday confirm their economy is contracted by over 19% in the second quarter of this year. The last six months have seen businesses and workers put into a very serious situation, one which the Scottish Government has sought to address with a package of support to businesses worth over £2.3 billion to protect Scotland's economy and to ensure that as many people as possible keep their jobs. With over two-thirds of all Scottish firms still accessing the furlough scheme, it uh, currently is still supporting 217,000 people in Scotland and has been, and I'm happy to admit this, a crucial lifeline for people protecting thousands of jobs in the Stirling and Clipmanshire areas in my constituency alone. However, it's my view it doesn't go far enough, and I think members who have seen the submission that we've all had from the Federation of Small Businesses will also acknowledge that fact. And it should certainly not come to an end as planned in October. Speaking to local businesses in Clipmanshire, Bridge of Allen and Dunblane in my constituency, I know that many are not yet seeing normal levels of trade. This means there is simply no way that they are in a financial position to retain their full workforce. Many of these businesses will have a viable long-term future, but only if they continue to be supported and allowed to recover. It's clear that to avoid large numbers of redundancies and harming your longer-term economic position, some form of the job retention scheme needs to remain in place. Research shows that even extending the furlough scheme, as referred by eight months, could save 61,000 jobs in Scotland. And the cost of saving those jobs would be met by the wider economic benefits it would deliver, such as increasing GDP, of course, tax revenues, and preventing higher levels of unemployment, which we know come with longer-term social and economic consequences. So for that reason, I welcome the range of efforts as been outlined by the Minister, announced by the Scottish Government through its programme for government, to train and retrain people who have lost their jobs through the crisis, as well as investment into supporting opportunities for young people and expanding the number of modern apprenticeship places available. All of this will be crucial in shaping our economy as we come out of this crisis. However, we are all acutely aware that the Scottish Government is doing this with a limited budget and no borrowing powers. In contrast, the UK Treasury has been able to fund business and employment support schemes to date entirely through borrowing. And it's worth pointing out it's not largesse given by a UK minister or the Treasury. This is money that is borrowed at the cost of Scottish taxpayers. They pay for this. So it's now essential the Scottish Parliament has granted the additional powers it needs to properly manage the response to the crisis as we move towards recovery. While the UK Tory Chancellor plans to prematurely end the furlough scheme entirely in just six weeks' time, we are seeing European countries such as France committing to extending its employment support scheme until July 2022, while Italy confirmed an 18-week extension until the end of 2020, and Germany has confirmed that its COVID adjusted scheme will continue until the end of 2021, bringing certainty, the point Alison Johnson made, to millions of workers and businesses who are worried about their future. And the lack of that worry, that concern over the jobs, helps the economy. The jobs and livelihoods of many people in my constituency and across Scotland are on the line. And the UK government must rethink its catastrophic plans to scrap the furlough scheme early and extend the measures now into 2021. Large-scale unemployment, I think we would all agree, seems extremely likely, but it doesn't have to be long-term unemployment. And we all know uh, the cost of long-term unemployment from the mistakes that were made in the 1980s. 
And if the Tories won't uh, let Holyrood have the powers, and if they won't undertake the borrowing, let's face it, they're good at borrowing £2 trillion of national debt under the Tories. It's doubled. If they won't borrow for this good purpose, as was outlined earlier on, then they should give the people of Scotland uh, the opportunity to do that. They should give the Parliament in Scotland the opportunity. And if they don't, the people of Scotland will not les uh, hesitate to let the Tories know what they think of them when it comes to the election next year. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Anna Bilyeu. Um, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. The COVID-19 public measures have presented Scotland's businesses and, crucially, its workers with unprecedented and sometimes seemingly insurmountable challenges. Plunging demand, deserted town centres and lower spending means Scotland's economy has become a challenging place in which to find and to keep employment. Now, the UK government has, of course, stepped up in some brilliant and well-publicised ways, most prominently in the form of the Jobs Retention Scheme, a vital part of the effort in the early days of the crisis to prevent an economic catastrophe. As a result of this support, innumerable people have been able to live through this tumultuous period in relative security, support their families, and avoid the worst effects of what amounted to an almost total shutdown of our physical economy. With no one to frequent coffee shops, buy goods on our high streets, no one to support jobs in our economy, the parts dependent on Scots being able to go out, spend and live normal lives. Now, while UK-wide action has not necessarily been perfect, actions of the Scottish Government, crucial to employees of businesses across Scotland, has caused many unnecessary difficulties. In spite of massive funding for the Scottish Government from the UK Treasury to organise and distribute, the SNP has failed on many fronts. The volume and persistence of complaints I have received, legitimate ones, from constituents about lack of support for businesses and individuals across Lothian have been specific, persistent and voluminous. There have, for example, not at the minute. There have, in, in a minute, was what I meant to say. There have, for example, been cases in which application deadlines have been abbreviated with little warning. Many, I understand, have found themselves ineligible for more generous targeted industry support, such as the Events Industry Support Fund, because they had applied in good faith to more general schemes early on in this crisis. I'll give way to the uh, Cabinet Secretary here. Jamie Harper. Uh, thank you uh, to Mr Lintus for uh, allowing me to intervene. He, he refers to the correspondence he's been receiving from his constituents. Can I ask, has he had any article of correspondence from any of his constituents calling for an end to the furlough scheme? Because I can tell him I've not had a single one. Gordon Lintus. I have had Correspondence from constituents very pleased with what the UK government has provided and also those that have received support from the Scottish government. Uh, the furlough scheme as such is not necessarily something that people have been focusing on um, because, because it's still running uh, and has been running. And uh, obviously, a lot of people have written because they know what they actually want is they want to see business, the economy and the country get back to normal. And part of that has to be that the situation that we're in changes. And uh, of course, other countries that have been referred to by the SNP benches have completely different setups in their economies when it comes to workers. Denmark, for example, it's been mentioned, very different setup. And of course, their scheme doesn't apply to the self-employed, to owner-managers, casual contracts? Does the minister consider that an approach where there is no legal minimum wage is something he'd like to bring in as part of a whole scheme approach to things? So simply lifting examples from other countries, Germany another example, where in fact they come from a totally different position and approach uh, and have uh, had a particular scheme that has simply been adjusted in light of COVID for something like going back to 1924. These are very, very different situations to the UK setup, or indeed the circumstances we find ourselves here in Scotland. And I think my constituents recognize that. They're not trying to uh, simply uh, lift things from other countries into here as the SNP government is suggesting uh, should be done. 
although not the whole system. So I think it's, it's down to the Chancellor to see and seek to, as he has, do what is best for the whole country, and that's in regard to a whole number of different measures, not just the furlough scheme. And that's what constituents are expecting from us. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Can I remind all members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons in good time? And can I call Annabel Ewing to be followed by Joanne Lamont? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have been called to speak in this very timely debate uh, called for by the Scottish Government on the urgent need for the UK Government to signal as soon as possible an extension to the furlough scheme. As we have heard, the furlough scheme is due to expire in just uh, over six weeks. This will be a disaster for jobs, in particular in those sectors which have been most heavily impacted by the COVID-19 global pandemic. The UK Government is on the record as saying that it would do whatever it takes to protect jobs and livelihoods. The UK Government must therefore now act. For presiding officer, there is, this is uh, about people's lives. It is about their careers. It is about their businesses. It is about their ability to pay their bills and to look after their families. Predictions have been made that a failure on the part of the UK government to signal an extension in some form to the furlough scheme will result in short order in a tsunami of job redundancy notices being issued and very significant job losses ensuing. As the MSP for Cowton Beath constituency, which comprises many communities still fragile following the mass unemployment policies of the Thatcherite Tory government of the 1980s, it is absolutely unacceptable that we could see further scarring of those communities still suffering from significant deprivation. As we have heard, in terms of analysis carried out by the Scottish Government's chief economist, it has been estimated that the direct cost of extending the furlough scheme in Scotland till June of next year would be around £850 million. The chief economist concluded that the economic benefits that would ensue, such as an increasing GDP, would mean that such spend could in effect pay for itself. It is estimated that 61,000 Scottish jobs could be saved, and perhaps I too could put the 850 million uh, upfront cost in some context in this re regard by recalling the UK government spend on, for example, the HS2 rail project in England, currently estimated at 106 billion pounds and counting, or perhaps, presiding officer, the Crossrail project in London. 18 billion pounds and counting, or even, as has been referred to, the Trident nuclear submarine renewal project, currently estimated at 205 billion pounds and counting. Presiding officer, if the UK government can spend 205 billion pounds on weapons of mass destruction, surely it is not unreasonable to spend 850 million pounds to save 61,000 jobs to avoid an economic crisis and to avoid the social devastation that would result from that. I think it is indeed instructive to look first of the UK where we see that an extension to equivalent types of furlough schemes uh, has been made in Germany and in France and in Austria and in Ireland and in Switzerland and in Australia. And indeed, I think it is worth noting in this regard that the extent of the fiscal stimulus package announced by the German government in the summer uh, amounts to some 130 billion euros, representing 4% of German GDP. And I think we can contrast that with the similar package announced by the UK government, representing 20 billion pounds sterling. Uh, quite a different level of spend and focus on uh, economic recovery. Presiding officer, the reason that we are having to have this debate is that we here in the Scottish Parliament do not have the necessary powers to just get on and do what normal independent countries do across the world, and that is to borrow to help their economies through these unprecedented times. If the UK government will not extend the furlough scheme, then we must uh, secure the necessary borrowing power so that we can act to save jobs in Scotland, to save businesses, to prevent mass unemployment and social devastation. That is what normal independent countries have opted to do. And in the interest of Scotland's economy and well-being, Scottish independence cannot come soon enough. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
Thank you. Joanne Lamont to be followed by George Adam. Thank you very, very much. Um, I only have four minutes, so my comments shall naturally be constrained. But for the absence of doubt or misrepresentation, I support the extension of the furlough scheme beyond October because I believe it will make a difference to the economy rather than, as we heard in the last speech, something about yet again about the core position of the SNP. Now, that's the easy bit. I have to say, though, I did find it dispiriting to see the energy with which so many in the Scottish Government side um, have spent their time establishing the dividing line on furlough, which I see is in sharp contrast with their approach to the responsibilities and opportunity that power brings to them. There is an urgency about the scale of the crisis that I do not see in the Scottish Government response. It is impossible to overstate how serious this is. We know there are people who were in secure work or running the most secure of businesses who have seen the ground opening up under their feet. There are people who worked in hospitality um, who have already been made redundant despite furlough. I know there are many young people who are already working their way around businesses, handing in CVs. There are people spending all day applying for jobs with little or no response. And the scale of distress and despair is palpable. And the response of this government has to be commensurate. We know that there are those in frontline hospitality and retail jobs managing the COVID rules and the routine abuse that goes with it, seeing a deterioration in their conditions and a seeping realisation on occasion exploited by unscrupulous employers, that their jobs are so fragile that they, uh, they dare not complain. And I think there is an issue in whatever schemes are developed around conditionality and the rights and expectations of employees from businesses that are securing public funds. And of course, we do know that intention without action is simply daydreaming. And we need government to be proactive in creating jobs and sustaining jobs, in providing training in real terms. There are targets, goals, funding evidence that people in our communities know about and can access. Talking about it takes you only so far. Now, I have some ideas of what may be done, and I'd welcome the Scottish Government's comments on that. What budgets have shifted from the budget decided by the Scottish Government on their own funding to address this crisis? Have you changed the remit of Scottish enterprise so that, again, it's responsible for people and place, the opportunities that people need, not just looking for successful businesses and giving them money? What targets, what new targets have been given and set for Skills Development Scotland to deliver training, jobs, apprenticeships? And how do people know that they exist? What funding has been available, made available, for example, to housing associations and housing co-ops to allow them to plan for the kind of economic opportunities within a local environment? How much of the money that has come from the UK has already gone out the door? And as a matter of urgency, what extra money has gone to local authorities? Money was made available to the Scottish Government to support local authorities. And the Finance Minister said she needed to know what local authority plans were before she could release the money. What a failure of imagination. Unable to understand exactly why local authorities need money now to support care organisations, to see more support for vulnerable young people in schools post-lockdown, to create home linkers workers, more cleaners, partnerships harnessing private, public, third sector organisations, training providers to give the economic and employment opportunities that people need, and to support the very organisations that can help people to cope with COVID, to access the opportunities that are out there. The First Minister spoke this morning about avoidable redundancies in relation to furlough. There are redundancies happening in my city now to organisations which could help those who need support in order to secure work. This has been going on for seven months. Now, there is never enough money, but there is money. And the fear is that delay means the crisis gets worse and the money remains unspent only perhaps to make a reappearance next year when it's all too late. If ever there was a time for government leadership, it is now. This debate should have been about pulling everyone in this parliament and beyond together in to, be, to match that crisis. It's not enough to say what should be done elsewhere. You need to work with everyone in here to identify real plans, but also on how to deliver them. It's simply not good enough 
to say we're going to do this and we're going to do that when out there in our communities there is no real evidence that these initiatives are working. And of course the UK government needs to pay attention on the question of furlough. But we all have a responsibility to understand that is a necessary but not sufficient condition to address the scale of the crisis that all too many people within our communities are facing. Thank you very much. George Adam to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And Presiding Officer, I would just like to say that this debate is probably one of the most important debates we can currently have because we're dealing with people's lives and livelihoods. And one of the things that I would like everyone to think about and acknowledge is that I think it is important that everyone works together in order to see ourselves through to the other side of this because that is the only way this goes beyond party colour and party parliaments and different uh, institutions because at the end of the day these are real lives and real issues we're dealing with. At one point, presiding officer, I thought of redoing my speech from yesterday but I decided I would spare colleagues that today. But I've got a whole lot of new stuff to bring to the debate. And as I said previously, retaining the job retention scheme is the most important thing we can do. But it's just a start. It's one of the things we can do in our economic recovery. Because we are dealing with, quite literally, people's futures, their families' lives, and the very important issue of keeping a roof over their head. How we support them, them in this, their time of needs in our very varied, very varied constituencies is the most important and vital point during these very difficult and challenging times. The UK government wants to withdraw the scheme uh, in a couple of months or next month, and this is just not good enough. We all know that yesterday's announcement from the Scottish Government, and it's been mentioned before, but it has to be said again, that 61,000 jobs in Scotland would be saved if the furlough scheme was extended for eight months. Presiding officer, that's 61,000 jobs saved and an extra eight months extension. The wider economic benefits of this alone would pay for itself. But it's even more important than that. It will help every man, woman and child that is supported by these 61,000 jobs. You would think that the Conservatives would see the sense in extending the furlough scheme. Uh, scheme, but they do not appear to be listening. Last week, as I mentioned earlier, in debate in the House of Commons, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Bartley, said, and I quote, it is in no one's long-term interest for the scheme to continue, least of those trapped in a job that only exists because of the furlough scheme. President Officer, I do not see that anyone in these circumstances is trapped in that job. That is what is supporting them through this very difficult time and ensuring that they and their families have a future so that we can rebuild our economy when we get into a more positive place in the future. They don't feel trapped by the job retention scheme. They feel as if that is one, one bit of stability in a world that is in chaos at the moment as they try and get through. And I would urge Conservative members here to please look at this and talk to their colleagues in Westminster, because this is something that we all need to work together to ensure that we can provide for our constituents. You know, yesterday I heard from Mr Simpson saying that the UK government, uh, saying that there would be a job tsunami if they didn't have the support. A job tsunami. Well, one thing, this is the start. Support the idea of continuing the job retention scheme. That will help as we continue, because these are indeed very challenging times, presiding officer. So far, presiding officer, we have asked much of the people of Scotland during these difficult times. They have supported us in every way they can in order for us to get through these difficulties. Presiding officer, I will finish on this one point. If Westminster won't do this, then let them get out of the way and give this parliament the powers, and we will ensure that this parliament supports Scotland's people. Thank you, Sandra White, to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, before, before I do go to the body of my speech, I think it's really important to reiterate not what George Adams has said, but also Keith Brown as well. The monies that we get from this furlough scheme, it's not from the generosity of the Tories at Westminster, it's monies every single person in Scotland and Wales and in Ireland put in to the Treasury through taxes. And I think it's about time that was recorded and people be told about it. 
but it's not it's not just the fact that I want to say about the taxes. We're responsible for basically paying for that and we'll pay for it. So we should actually have a say in how that money is spent. And if we say in this, this parliament and in Scotland that that should be extended, then it should be extended. If England doesn't want to extend it or Northern Ireland or Wales, well, that's up to them and their so-called governments. But if we want to, we pay into it and we should have a bigger say in how that money is delivered and how it's spent. And I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much, presiding officers. Now, like many members have already mentioned throughout the chamber, I have certainly been inundated with constituents who are really deeply worried about what the future holds for them and the employment, employers, small and medium-sized businesses, which in my constituency, there are hundreds in the Glasgow Kelvin area, and they're really, really terrified for their future if they're actually going to be there you know, in six months' time, never mind a couple of years' time. And it's incredibly difficult for these employers and employees as well, and they do need our support throughout the country. And that's why I say for the UK government to be even thinking about withdrawing the support, it's a real hammer blow, which will have a devastating effect. In Glasgow alone, there's been up to 80,000 people furloughed. And we welcome that. But as I said earlier on in my opening remarks, we pay into that. And people shouldn't forget that we do pay into it as well. So it's not a handout that we are getting. I think it's been mentioned by Joanne Lamont and others, perhaps, uh, the hardest hit sector, certainly in my constituency anyway, uh, is entertainment and recreation. And uh, over half the workforce is furlough. And really, we're really worried about what happens, you know, in six months' time, about the businesses and employees when the scheme ends. Will it still be there? Uh, your nighttime economy is really important for uh, Glasgow city centre and throughout Scotland. But my constituency is very, very important and at this moment in time, we can't have the nightclubs open because of the COVID-19. It's not the businesses' faults or the employers' faults. So therefore, a caring government would be one of them who would step in and help these businesses and ensure that they actually you know, flourish instead of closing, closing down. Uh, and I must say that they're fighting for their continued existence. And they've been th put through so much and they're terribly, terribly worried that they will not be here to start to rebuild uh, at all, basically. And if you end this furlough scheme, uh, basically it would be the death knell for all of these. Now, you know, Glasgow's UNESCO City of Music, we have all the various concerts as well. It's, it's very, very worrying that these may not be here. I mean, we're already not having half the stuff that we would have at Christmas and New Year, etc. But what happens next year? And that's why it's so important. And I know that others had mentioned, Annabel Yoon had mentioned the other countries, other European countries, far better at the furlough scheme. And I think uh, Keith Brown also mentioned it, France, Germany, Australia, et cetera, et cetera, who are actually extending it to next year, July 2021, and other countries extending it to the end of this year. So if they can do it, why can't the UK government do it? And I do reiterate this again, we pay a lot of money in through taxes, and I think we should have a say in where our taxes go, and furlough should actually be extended. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you very much, Rachel Hamilton, to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and may I refer members to my register of interests as a shareholder in a small business. It's clear from the contributions today across the Chamber uh, that we agree that the interventions by the UK Government were a lifeline in protecting nearly a third of Scotland's workforce. In my own constituency, around 11,000 jobs were furloughed. Whilst the Chancellor's support for businesses in all parts of the UK was unprecedented, today we discuss what more can be done with the economic levers that we have available here. With the shrinking economy now 21.1% smaller than in 2019, the SNP Government must take affirmative action to help individuals at risk of unemployment and for those furthest away from the job market. However, we cannot let Scottish work workers dangle in perpetuity. A shrinking economy means less on the order books, fewer widgets, fewer employees. Less work leads to a reduced workforce. Sustaining the same number of employees in an organisation becomes unsustainable. However, the question I would ask the SNP is after eight months, they've done the, they've done the sums, after eight months, what happens? What if we are in this pandemic, eight months down the line or beyond, what happens then? It's almost like a holding chamber for 
the workforce. And I think that we should be looking beyond those. I think we should be looking beyond that, Miss Ewing, with interventions that are reskilling, upskilling, retraining, and allowing people to have the dignity through schemes like Fair Start Scotland, which are quite frankly a shambles. Now, compounding the woeful economic outlook, of course, are the restrictions that many businesses have seen due to government policies um, and, and due to localised and regional um, lockdowns. And I think it's important that the SNP do look at ways to support businesses uh, more fervently, um, at, at, because we all know it's not their fault. And instead of putting all her eggs in one basket, I agree with jo jo Joanne Lamont that Nicola Sturgeon should consider the gift of the um, measures that she has within her own government, such as extending the 100% business rate reliefs um, and also repurposing areas of the Scottish budget, um, reconsidering you know, what we can do in, in that sense. But also, we haven't heard what the £6.5 million in Barnet Consequentials um, that have come to this Parliament, we haven't heard what's happened to them. Has all the money been spent, as Nicola Sturgeon promised, um, it, it, to, to go towards businesses? Let me move on now to um, finding uh, employment right now. It's exceptionally difficult, especially for young people and women. Women and young people have been worst effect, affected by this pandemic. The number of women, women in unsecure and temporary jobs has risen by a third in the time that this SNP government have been in power. Furthermore, women are more likely to lose their jobs in a recession to be affected by underunemployment. So, two for young people, leaving school, college or university right now must be an incredibly daunting experience. In the latest universal credit figures between June and July, a higher proportion of people starting on UC have been in the 16 to 24 year old group. Um, more than any point in the last uh, uh, several years. Yet we have seen the UK government act swiftly through the Kickstart scheme to provide unprecedented two billion funding along with the job retention bonus scheme that my colleague Maurice Golding spoke about. And we see significant financial and policy backing to help young people get on the job ladder and, and for businesses to retain employees. And concerningly, this ambitious package of me measures sits in stark contrast to what is on offer from this government. Nicola said, Sturgeon said of young people, it is not their fault, and it certainly isn't. Jackie Bailey is absolutely right. Take, for example, the SNP's youth guarantee, worth 60 million, whilst it is welcome, Sandy Begby's report, absolutely welcome. But it f f uh, falls woefully short of what Scottish young people need right now. The first report into the Youth Guarantee Scheme admitted work hasn't even started on an implementation plan. When, where, how? Come on, let's move on this. We haven't got much time, and I haven't got much time, so I'm going to sit down. Thank you. Call, call Bob Doris to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, I thank Rachel Hamilton for trying really hard to get some consensus there. Well, well done, Ms Hamilton. Um, um, President Officer, none of us really know what the economy will look like this time next year. We just don't. Uncertainty over demand, uncertainty over markets, not just due to COVID restrictions but also, uh, caused by lockdown, but also due to Brexit uncertainty. And on demand, I note the Scottish Government has estimated that extending furlough quite rightly called the job retention scheme, could save 61,000 jobs. Just think about the demand generated or indeed lost, presiding officer, if 61,000 workers are moved from paid employment on to benefits. And I think Rachel Hamilton mentioned widgets. I'll tell you what will actually happen is when we put people on to benefits and then the economy bounces back, we'll be importing those widgets from Germany and keeping people in benefits in Scotland. It's time to support the Scottish workforce, Ms Hamilton. Of course, it's the human cost that will really take its toll. Individuals and families out of work and on benefits and on reduced and fixed incomes, forcing real hardship. It's also the loss of jobs to the economy that may take many years to return. The UK Government called the loan scheme again, which I welcome and I alluded to earlier, is called the bounce back loan scheme. But without an extension to furlough, there may be jobs not to bounce back towards. I, I see again, President Officer, what will the economy look like this time next year? When we've ditched our high school jobs and others have retained theirs, we'll be importing 
This will damage our economy. It makes no sense. Furlough is sustaining jobs for my constituents. Ending furlough, I have no doubt, will see many, many jobs lost. I urge Rishi Sunak, as the vast majority in this parliament do also, to think again on furlough. Take a compliment. We actually think it's worked very well. We want to see it continue. Targeted, if required, in manufacturing industry, in transport and aviation, in hospitality, and so on. Also have no doubt the huge inequalities that will come from this economic crisis and recession. I don't think anyone's referred to the close the gap briefing we had ahead of this debate. So I'll maybe do so now and the impact this is likely to have on women. I'll mention just two, two things they say. Because of occupational segregation, women are more likely to work in a shutdown sector such as hospitality and retail. And this is especially the case for BME women and younger women. Women are more likely to have lost their jobs and had their hours cut. Women already face economic inequality within society. This will only compound it. Same for BAME members of the communities that I serve and the predominantly working class communities I serve as well. My constituents in Maryhill and Springburn, I really, really worry, will be disproportionately impacted by this. And the time that I have left, presiding officer, um, I want to mention the universal basic income that a few members have mentioned. Uh, I only refer to it because others brought it up. It is not possible to deliver that without the full fiscal powers in this parliament or the compliance of the UK government. We currently have neither. And that's not just my view, that's a perspective within the Social Security Committee in this parliament. Others have mentioned the youth guarantee, the Scottish youth guarantee, £60 million for starters, uh, but also the UK government kickstart scheme, £2 billion across the UK. Now, my understanding of that scheme, it will pay a minimum wage for up to 25 hours for six months for young people up to 24 years old. Well, that's welcome to a degree. But to be honest with you, I would rather see the, the money that will be paid out in relation to the kickstart scheme given to this government and this parliament and a coordinated, essential and strategic youth guarantee come from this parliament. I do not trust the UK government to manage that well. Actually, in closing, presiding officer, there's almost full agreement with the exception of the Conservatives in relation to sustaining and extending the furlough scheme. And actually, despite the tone of some of the debate, the vast majority of things that we have to do to address the economic crisis caused by COVID-19, again, with the exception of the Conservatives, we have that consensus. I hope we find a way to express it more often in this chamber. Thank you very much. I call Fulton McGregor, who will be the last open debate speaker. Thank you, President Officer. I think the points uh, today have been well made. There can be absolutely no doubt that the UK Government should extend the furlough scheme. Six countries, including our neighbours in France and Ireland, have already extended their equivalent schemes, so let's not be last to the party here. Yes, many folk are now back at work, but equally, there are sectors that are not and may not be for some time. As we've heard already, the tourism and hospitality sector is particularly affected. And also, as Bob Doris just mentioned there, Close the Gap provided us with a briefing it reporting a disproportionate impact on women also. We don't know what is going to happen with further local or even national restrictions. There's talk of um, curfews, um, pubs and restaurants closing at 10 o'clock as we go into the winter. So let's just take a common sense approach and expand the scheme. But, President Officer, I want to focus my speech on local issues that have been brought to me, and like others in the Chamber, there have been many and far too many to mention today. I've already spoken about the hospitality and tourism sector in struggling. Owners of small businesses like pubs and restaurants across Cope Bridge and Chryson have come to me concerned what the end of furlough will mean. Already some pubs and restaurants locally have already shut their doors, and we can't stand back and allow there to be more. These are people's jobs and livelihoods on the line. Furlough could help if there is another full lockdown or if curfews are introduced in the coming months and less staff are needed. I have also had contact from nightclub owners too. Furlough, as Sandra White said, furlough has been a massive safety net for them, with little prospect of nightclubs opening up any time soon, or at least in their uh, pre-COVID forum. Here is yet another whole industry that can be supported by simply continuing furlough. Soft play sector, uh, centres too a very similar position, although they do have an indicative date in early October. 
though we have to say nothing is certain with the way things are going with infection rates, and they've already remained closed a long time. I've been speaking with the owner of Funky Monkeys Soft Play in Coat Bridge, an excellent facility. I have to say that I hope colleagues with children, I'm looking at Bob Doris, will get a chance to visit in the future. But he tells me, while the £10,000 grant near the start was very welcome, they are now on their knees. Furlough being taken away from such businesses at this hour could be the final straw. Now, don't get me wrong, President Officer, I think sectors that remain affected, like nightclubs and soft plays and the others that we've heard about, dance groups, wedding industry and more, need no, more support than the furlough scheme. And I have written to the government um, just recently about soft plays, for example. And again, I know much of this relies on UK funding. But the simple message from this debate is that the removal of furlough could exasperate the situation. We are here to stand up for our constituents locally. So I hope that everybody at decision time tonight, regardless of party, can do that. And, President Officer, I also want to touch on leisure trusts eh, in that sector generally. Brian Whittle eh, asked about the pressures facing this sector at FMQ today. But I'd politely say to my colleague that one of the, one of the possible fixes is him and his party supporting this motion tonight and the call for furlough to be extended. I have friends who work in the local NL and Glasgow trusts, and they've been in furlough through this time. Their industry is now returning, as we know, um, at, but they're returning to a major period of uncertainty. Take the famous time capsule water park in Coatbridge. It's due to open up at the end of the month on a much restricted basis. Quite rightly, I have to say, we need to put safety first, but it also stands to reason that less staff will be required. This is a situation across the leisure sector, especially as some activities cannot yet return. The furlough scheme is absolutely essential to get these bodies through this further difficult period and to help them readjust to different staffing needs. President officer, I will conclude by saying that this SNP government have taken action to support both employers and employees impacted by coronavirus, and we will do everything in our power to ensure our economy and labour market feel supported. There's been a package of £2.3 billion in place so far and committed to a further £100 million to targeted employment support. But we all need to do our bit. Everybody needs to do their bit. And I call again for everybody to support the motion today and for the furlough scheme to be extended. Thank you very much. We now move to closing speeches. I should remind members that all those who take part in the debate should be back in the chamber uh, for closing speeches. And can I call Alex Rowley? Thank you, President Officer. Um, in closing for Labour, I would want to reiterate the point that Jackie Bailey made, which is that Scotland cannot build back better in isolation from the rest of the UK. And that's why we need a partnership that includes the UK government, the Welsh, the Northern Irish governments, as well as the regions across the UK. We build back better when we can build back together. Uh, the point that, that Willie Rennie made, I thought, was also very uh, pertinent, which is that there is a danger that all the good work that the Chancellor created by bringing about the furlough, which I think the majority of members in this chamber welcome, there is a danger that that, that could be lost. And if, if the Scottish Tories supported the idea that we, we need to build back together across the UK, then surely they should be knocking down the door in number 11 and pushing for them to extend the furlough. The Tory amendment does not address the key issue of the government's motion, and therefore Labour cannot support the Tory amendment. Willie Rennie also made another point where he made reference to the Keynesian economic post-war consensus and I, I agree with them. I believe it is time for a new post-Keynesian consensus for building back the country back as we recover from this pandemic. Guaranteed jobs must be at the forefront of this. Guaranteed access to education, skills, training for new jobs must be at the forefront. Guaranteed access for housing must be at the forefront. We need to build back by investing in our infrastructure and many of the needs that, that, that are existing within communities. So we support the government motion. But George Adam, I think, made the point where he asked, give us more powers and we will use them. What we say today, use the powers 
of this Parliament. Do not make excuses and blame others. We have in the powers in this bar Parliament to begin that build back, and it's high time we were using those powers. And I do believe the Scottish people will start to see through that argument. This is, this is a strong Parliament, and we should be using every power at our disposal. Scottish Labour's plan, for example, for a Green New Deal and creating good, skilled jobs that includes expanding Scotland's bus network, investing in buying new electric buses for domestic, from domestic manufacturers. That would create direct jobs in Scotland. We need to see a national house build programme across Scotland in order to one, in a minute, one, demonstrate that we can invest and put a roof over people's heads. The level of housing crisis in this country is unacceptable. We have the powers to be able to have a, and invest in a national house build programme. We should be looking at the fuel poverty bill. The fuel poverty bill that was passed by this parliament was, in my view, it lacked ambition. We should be investing in that area. The, the budget that we have for the flood prevention and investing in flood prevention in Scotland is far too low when we have flooding problems happening as a result of climate change across Scotland. So there is one example where you could bring about that level of investment. Bob Jarvis. Taking the intervention. Um, I really welcome Mr Riley's comments. He's actually got a very strong track record in this parliament of trying to reach a budget consensus with the Scottish Government. And you're given lots of ideas for what could be budget negotiations with the Scottish Government. I don't work at that pay grade, Mr Rowley, I have to say. But I really hope what you're doing is signalling from the Labour Party is that rather than posturing on the budget, you, you actually want to secure a consensus and have a, a budget in Scotland's national interest going forward. So any comments on that I would very much welcome. In the time I've got left, what I would, I would say to Bob Doris, and we need to work together on this, is firstly the capital budget has been underspent for this year. Labour also supports uh, expanding and extension of the borrowing powers from this Parliament, and we will work with the Scottish Government to make that case. So those are two examples where we could see major investment, major capital investment taking place in housing, in flood control, in all these areas that will address the housing crisis, but will create jobs. It will give people the opportunity for skills and education and training. So we need a programme. So in conclusion, presiding officer, we would urge the Tories to knock down that door at number 11, get the extension of the furlough. But we would say to this parliament, let's use the power of this parliament to invest in Scotland's future. I call on murder Fraser. Thank you, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, this has, has been quite a short debate. There's been some consensus and some points of disagreement. So let me start with the points of uh, consensus, because I think there has been a broad recognition from all uh, uh, sectors in the Chamber of the value and importance of the job retention scheme. More than 900 jobs have been supported. Of those, more than half, more than 50 per cent of people had returned to work by August. Even in the uh, SNP's paper they published, uh, I think it was yesterday, uh, about their plans to extend the scheme. They say this, the UK scheme compares favourably to wage subsidy schemes in other countries. And they credit it with keeping uh, unemployment in Scotland at a rate 3 to 4% lower than otherwise uh, it would have been. So I welcome that and I welcome the comments from the Minister earlier in the debate recognising that this is one of the most generous schemes in the world and has made a huge difference to supporting the Scottish economy. And of course that's not the only thing the UK government has done in relation to supporting jobs in Scotland. We've had the job uh, retention bonus that was mentioned by Maurice Golden, £1,000 for every uh, employee being kept on, £2 billion in the kickstart scheme, creating hundreds of thousands of high quality work uh, placements, expansion in work search report, the cut in VAT for hospitality, the eat out help out scheme, and so the list uh, goes on. But we're here talking about the job retention scheme specifically, and I, I do recognise the point that's been made by many members uh, across the chamber about concerns as to what will happen 
when the scheme comes to the end at the end of October. And I've had this from businesses myself who are concerned about this prospect of a, a cliff edge. And it, it is the case, while a lot of people have gone back to work, there are still sectors of the economy which are struggling because they are still restricted. And I had an exchange earlier with the uh, Cabinet Secretary when she was here about the uh, wedding industry in Scotland, which is one sector desperate to get back to work, but because of current restrictions are very much constrained to do so, and therefore a lot of employees are furloughed. So what do we do next? Well, the SNP have called this afternoon for an extension to the furlough scheme. It is, of course, the easiest thing in the world for the SNP government to call for something to be done by somebody else. Yeah. And call for something to be done they don't have to pay for, that somebody else will have to pay for. And I think we have to look at, and Alec Rowley made this point just when he was winding up a moment ago, what the Scottish government can do themselves to try and assist uh, the situation. And let's remember the Scottish government have been given a guarantee of an, an additional £6.5 billion pounds in the current financial year. And Joanne Lamont made a very good point. Has all that money been wisely spent? Has it all been spent? Where has it gone? We still don't know how much of that money has been spent. We still don't know where it has all gone. And we could do with some answers to that question. And in that context of money, let's not forget that the Scottish Government, the SNP Government since 2007, has benefited from fiscal transfers from the rest of the UK, totalling over £62 billion. £62 billion coming from the rest of the UK to support spending in Scotland. Now, it wouldn't be a debate in this chamber without the usual tiresome mentions from SNP members of independence. And we even had it from the, the, the Minister. If only we were independent, we could extend the furlough scheme forever, indefinitely. No word as to how it would be paid for, because, of course, there wouldn't be enough in the way of unicorns and fairy dust in an independent Scotland to pay for the furlough scheme we've had, never mind any extension to do it. They simply couldn't afford it, uh, presiding officer. But I, I accept the point that's been made by a number of members. I accept there are issues uh, for business as we get towards the end of October. So we do need to look at what can be done to try and fill the gap. There is an argument for looking at an extension to the furlough scheme. There might be an argument for looking at an extension in, say, particular sectors of the economy, which have been hardest hit. But it's not a conclusive argument. And that's why we're not supporting the government uh, motion today, because we are not persuaded that is the only answer at this particular point. And the reason I say that is because the economy is changing. We have to recognise this. There are some jobs that existed before COVID that may not have a long-term future because of economic changes. To take one example, we do know as a result of COVID that more people will work from home rather than commuting to a place of work. That will have an impact on the supply of office space, on the servicing of office space. It will have an impact on uh, transport services, on the number of people uh, using public transport. We heard a debate yesterday about aviation. I suspect it will be a long time before people are flying in the numbers they were flying last year. And a furlough scheme extension of another eight months isn't going to be a lot of help in the long term to people in that sector. And Rachel Hamilton made a really important point because what we need to be doing is supporting the people who are in jobs that may not have a long term future because of economic change and using resources in terms of retraining and support rather than extending the furlough scheme necessarily for those people for a longer term period. And that's the sort of solution we should be looking at. Yeah. So something should replace the furlough scheme. That's, that's what we would say. It might be a targeted extension. It might be a direct job subsidy. It might be something like more cuts to employers' national insurance. It might be something else. And I know that the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, will be looking at all these possibilities, presiding officer. And what I would say to the Chamber is we shouldn't be tying his hands to one particular solution where there's a whole range of other things he is currently looking at as alternatives to make sure we address these legitimate concerns from the uh, business community as to what's going to happen after uh, the end of furlough scheme. Presiding officer, I, I hear members shouting from the benches. I would be happy to take an intervention, but I think I'm now finally in my, in my final minute. So let me just say this in closing. Um, we should recognise the benefits of the furlough scheme. It has been massively to the advantage of workers in Scotland and business in Scotland. And we should also agree that we do need more action from the UK government 
after the end of October. But we should consider all the options, not tie ourselves to one particular outcome, as this motion before us would do. And above all, presiding officer, we need to ask the Scottish Government to look to their own resources, all the extra money they have been given to support business in Scotland better than they currently have been doing. That is the point we make in our amendment, which I am pleased to support. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Jamie Hepburn to close and wind up the debate. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. And uh, in closing, I want to, to thank all those who have uh, contributed uh, to the debate from across all parts of the Chamber. Uh, I, like Murdo uh, Fraser, uh, I try and look for and seek consensus on these matters as well. And indeed, I was going to reflect on how consensual his contribution was right up until the moment he started to go off on one about unicorns and fairy dust, which, if I might say, was not such a positive uh, contribution, because we're here debating a serious issue, an issue of the utmost importance, and that is how we sustain our economy, our businesses and our people in what continues to be an extraordinarily uh, difficult period. And I think there has been, and this is where I bring, come back to consensus, there has been consensus established today that the job retention scheme, as established to their credit, as established by the UK government, has been an effective uh, mechanism and a vital contribution in supporting and sustaining people over the last period of time. I thought it was interesting that Myrtle Fraser said that more action will be necessary, something else should be in place. But I thought it was telling that he didn't say what should come in its place. Yeah. And neither does the Conservative amendment say what should come in its place. And in reflecting on the fact that he himself made this point in intervening on me and then in his own contribution, it, reflecting on the success of a scheme that has been in place that has supported people, surely our starting position could be to look at that scheme and consider an extension of it as a sensible way forward. And on that basis, uh, briefly, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised, genuinely surprised the Minister wasn't listening to the range of alternative possibilities I laid out. I talked about a possible extension to the scheme on a sectoral basis. I talked about a new job subsidy support. I talked about cuts to national insurance. There's a range of possibilities we have put forward in this debate. What we've been saying is we shouldn't be stuck on only one outcome as the Scottish Government is. Yeah. And I can't help but notice that the Conservatives didn't settle on a proposition and place it before Parliament today for our consideration. We have done that and I hope this Parliament will reflect on the success of the scheme and the necessity to continue it over the coming period of time and sends a very clear and strong message uh, to the UK Government at decision time. But I have also listened carefully uh, to the points raised during uh, the course of the debate uh, today. And I do recognise, and I think I made this point very clearly in my opening remarks, that there is, it is incumbent upon this Government to respond to the circumstances we find ourselves in just now. And indeed, I laid out uh, the range of ways in which we seek to do that. And if any member, because I do agree, this has to be a collective and shared endeavour, such as the nature of the crisis before us. If any member wants dialogue on any element of what we're seeking to take forward on the youth guarantee, uh, we'll be very happy to have that uh, dialogue. On the amendments before us, members will be unsurprised that uh, we will not be supporting uh, the Conservative uh, amendment this evening, not least for the reason it removes the call to extend the furlough scheme, which has been the very point of today's debate. But I, I thought it was uh, interesting that, um, and it goes back to the point that I've been making about reflecting on the success of the scheme. Morris Golden was complaining about SNP members booing the scheme. Well, we're certainly not doing that today, Mr Golden. We're calling for an extension of uh, the, uh, the, the scheme. And, uh, but in recognising that we should do that. I thought it was a, an odd observation of Mr Golden's to express concern about the wider economic impact in the relation to 
uh, his concerns about uh, borrowing, because we know that the job retention bonus scheme, which Rachel Hamilton mentioned, is going to be paid for through borrowing. That's how that will be paid for. That's going to cost £9.4 billion, where we also know a short-term extension to the furlough scheme would cost only marginally more, £10 billion. And if we consider the comments of the Resolution Foundation, who said the job retention bonus of £1,000 for firms that bring back furloughed workers and still employ them in January will not, will not make a major difference to employment levels. And the National Institute for Economic and Social Research said extending the furlough scheme by a further eight months at an estimated cost of £10 billion would have been a relatively inexpensive measure and by preventing a rise in long-term unemployment must have paid for itself. So we're calling on the UK government to do what other jurisdictions have done, what other countries are doing and extending their equivalent of the furlough scheme. And I say to Gordon Lindhurst uh, that he asked if I believe we should lift systems from the other countries that we mentioned. No, is the answer. I do not believe that we should do that. But what I do believe is that we should, what we should see here in Scotland and indeed across the UK is that we should look to the example of Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Ireland, Sweden, Switzerland, or further afield, Australia and Canada, and not seek to ape or replicate their scheme, but copy what they are doing in the sense of recognising the necessity of extending the period of their equivalent scheme of furlough to see people over the course of this very difficult period in time. On Ms Bailey's amendment, I would reflect it makes reference to a number of areas in which the Scottish Government has already taken action to try and soften the impact of the pandemic. We will be supporting Ms Bailey's amendment. Our current economic strategy, based on the mutually reinforcing pillars of boosting competitiveness and tackling inequality remains in place. We've published a range of strategies in areas including transport, manufacturing and innovation. Our infrastructure investment plan is helping to boost inclusive economic growth, tackle the global climate emergency, and build sustainable places. Our future skills action plan points us in the direction of ensuring we have or we're providing people with the attributes and talent that will be needed for the industries of the future, responding to the point that was made in conclusion uh, at, by Mr Fraser. Of course, we must ensure people have that uh, skill set. The Programme for Government commits us to introducing an inward investment plan and updating our climate change plan. We have the National Manufacturing Institute beginning its work in supporting innovation, skills and productivity. All of those are measures in place to ensure that we have an industrial strategy to meet current and future economic, social and environmental challenges and uh, opportunities. Uh, I thought, and I'll start to conclude, uh, President Officer, I, I thought it was interesting that Ms Bailey, though, said it would be the easiest thing in the world to blame the uh, UK government when things go wrong. Well, I, I want to make clear I'm, I'm not doing that uh, because in this instant, instance it hasn't gone wrong yet. They still have the opportunity to uh, recognise the necessity of extending the job retention uh, scheme but I do reflect on the fact, and Joanne Lamont was at pains to say to me, as if I was blissfully unaware, I can tell her I'm not unaware of the scale and the nature of the challenges that we face here and now in Scotland. I am fully cognizant of those challenges, and that's why it, we're responding with the range of initiatives that we're putting in place. The Green Jobs Fund, the Transition Training Fund, the Youth Guarantee, maximizing our range of capital investment to ensure that we create opportunities here in Scotland. So we will, in recognition the virus hasn't gone away and the challenge it brings, President Officer, continue to act accordingly. We will play our part in responding to support people in the face of COVID-19. But so too must the UK government. It's clear they must extend their income support schemes through the job retention scheme and in response to Rachel Hamilton's question for as long as is needed. We cannot stand back, presiding officer, and watch a potential tsunami of unavoidable redundancies. We cannot stand back and do nothing in the face of that uh, potential reality. We won't, but the question is, presiding officer, will the UK government? We have the chance to stand together.
tonight, this evening, and tell the UK Government the job retention scheme must be extended. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate on employment support, and we will move on in a moment to the next item of business. Thank you, colleagues. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 22737 on approval of an SSI. Could I call on Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move this motion? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much, Minister. The question on this will be put at decision time, to which we now turn. The first question this evening is that Amendment 22731.2 in the name of Maurice Golden which seeks to amend motion 22731 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on employment support be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We're going to move to a division and uh, because it's the first division, we're going to suspend proceedings for a short technical break to allow all members in the chamber and online to access the digital voting system. I suspend the meeting.
thank you, colleagues. Thank you, colleagues. Broadcasting is now back on, so we're going to resume proceedings. We believe all members online and in the chamber are now on board the voting system, and so we're going to move to the vote. Now, the division was on the amendment 23, sorry, 22731.2 in the name of Maurice Golden, which seeks to amend motion 22731 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on employment support. So members should cast their votes now on the amendment in the name of Maurice Golden. This is a one-minute division. Members should make a point of order if they think their vote has not been acknowledged. Thank you. The vote is now closed. We are just going to have a short pause to allow any members, either in the chamber or online, to raise a point of order if they feel their vote has not been uh, recognised. Thank you. No member has raised any objection. No member has raised any objection. So the result of the vote on amendment number 22731.2 in the name of Morris Golden is yes 29, no 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 22731.1 in the name of Jackie Bailey, who seeks to amend the, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Jamie Hepburn, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 22731 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on employment support be agreed, sorry, as amended, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We're going to move to division on motion 22731 in the name of Jamie Hepburn and members may cast their votes now. The vote is now closed. If any member does not think the vote was recorded, either here in the chamber or online, could they make a point of order to me now, please?
The result of the vote on motion 22731 in the name of Jamie Hepburn as amended is yes 89, no 28. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And the final vote, the final decision is on motion 22737 in the name of Graham Day on approval of an SSI. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you very much. That concludes decision time and I close this meeting.